Okay, so when you're ready, you can come back into the Zoom screen. And if you'd like to share what happened in the meditation, you can just uh, wave your hand. Um, so while you're thinking about it, I invite Shiva to give us... Uh... Yeah, actually, it was uh, pretty calm. There were some thoughts, but not many. And um, yeah... It's just okay, just good. Okay. <clears throat> so maybe now somebody would like to uh, volunteer. So no volunteers. Okay, I'll have to volunteer somebody. Ah, oh, Om is going to tell us. Okay. It's like um, somehow like a forgetfulness or something, as if like I forget any kind of reference, like where I am and what is happening, and as if there's like nothing happening or something. Just like it's kind of strange it happens often some t these days that somehow are just forgetting everything like and then kind of the, the the mind comes in again and asks what is this what, what is happening and then um you know it tries to find ah yeah this is happening and this is happening or something and then there was a bit of um bit of desire coming like just lust or desire coming up yeah okay thank you you're very honest <laughs> are you lusting for dinner or you're lusting for something else I've, I've had dinner already ah you had dinner already okay well <laughs> good okay Who else would like to volunteer? Okay, so how about Carly? You spent the day in the sauna, so you could probably be very relaxed now. Yeah. And it was, the meditation was very quiet. I feel like this, this day in the sauna had always yeah, makes it very quiet and somehow, what is the word? You feel just like fresh born and yeah. So there were some thoughts sometimes, but it's like there's a deepness which is very silent. And I had it also like Om was describing, it felt like there was just a space and Nothing was really in there, but it felt very peaceful and was, yeah. Okay, okay, very good. So I think I'm going to move on now. So if you remember last week, I was introducing this book. So for the next two months, I'm going to work through this whole book, chapter by chapter. And tonight we're going to start with, guess what? Chapter one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you haven't got a copy of this book, you might decide to get a copy because uh, that way I'm encouraging you in a way to read this book because uh, we produced this book some years ago and I think nobody ever really talked to me about this book. So I suspect that many people never read the book. So I thought I'll read it to you and then you can't escape so easily because this is really uh, got some good stuff in this book. So um, if you remember, the, the format of this book is that there are seven, seven chapters which follow the chakras in our 
the energy centers, the main energy centers in our body. So tonight we're on the first chapter, which is the base chakra. This is the energy comes up from the earth into our energy system from underneath. And it's also the energy center of reproduction and sex. And I found myself wearing this, this sweater today because this is also the color of the first chakra. Actually, I put it on, I think, yesterday. But anyway, I, when I put it on today, I realized this is exactly the right color. So I don't know how that happens. Anyway, uh, if you look at um, the first page, there's a quotation about the point of life. My understanding is that the point of our life, if anything, is to become self-realized. This means that we see the ego, the movie of our life, is not who we are. Then this, when this is clearly seen, something profoundly changes. So this is the crux of the spiritual work, you can say. This is, if you, if you get drawn into a, um, a, a different lifestyle, if you want to transform, transform your life, then this is the work that has to happen. And we have a very nice quotation here from J. Christian Murti. So probably most of you have heard of J. Christian Murti. Um, I was lucky to attend one of his retreats in England. So he was traveling basically between England, uh, USA, and India, these the three places. And we go every year to Tiruvamalai in the south of India. And he used to come to Chennai, about four hours drive away, because he was discovered by the Theosophical Society when he was a young boy of about <clears throat> 10, or, 10 or 11 years old. He and his brother were discovered by the Theosophical Society, and they intended that he would become the world teacher. Unfortunately, as, as he and his brother were growing up, his brother died, leaving only J. Christian Murti. And when he got to, I think, about 17, 18 years old, the Theosophical Society set up a huge meeting. I think it was in Holland. And this was the moment when they were going to announce him as the world teacher. So he got up and said, no, thank you. So if, you, if you're interested in that, it was a very amazing speech he made. You can find this speech, I'm sure, on the internet. So this speech is when he explained why he didn't want to be the world teacher. Anyway, so then he became the world teacher anyway, because um, he would travel through the world, mainly um, in, in the USA and, and Europe and uh, uh, India. And he also started schools. So there's a beautiful school in England, in the countryside of England, in a beautiful old house. He had one in India and another in the States. And uh, so anyway, he, he, became, he became the world teacher because he was the dominant spiritual voice for many years. He produced many books and a very beautiful, very beautiful man, very softly man. So he was Indian, but he was living always in a way in the West. <clears throat> so his, his uh, quotation, our minds are conditioned. That is an obvious fact conditioned by a particular culture or society, influenced by family, government, or religious conformity, and so on. Our minds are trained to accept fear and to escape, if we can, from that fear, never being able to resolve 
the whole nature and structure of fear. So our first question is, can the mind so heavily burdened completely resolve its conditioning and also its fears because it is fear that makes us accept conditioning. <clears throat> so recently we, we were having a, a, what we call a volunteer week here in our community. And there were several people who were very interested to get more involved in their own spiritual journey and perhaps get the support of the community. And in the end, they disappeared. We're happy that Marcel and uh, Hannah joined the community from that week. But many of the other people who had a great interest, they couldn't. They couldn't. And this, this moment where there is a, a kind of breakdown in your regular life, where you begin to see how you're conditioned, where you begin to see that you're operating very robot-like robot in many situations. So when you see this, you start to ask yourself, do I want to live like this? Do I want to live where in any moment what happens out of my, uh, how can I say, my existence, is very often you can see for yourself is just a conditioned response. So when we when we really get to see this, when we can accept it that it's true and see that we don't want this, then somehow automatically we start looking for something else, some other possibility. This happened to myself when I was. Uh, in my 20s. Apparently, I had a good job. I was living in a nice place in the center of London near a park. I had some friends, I had an old Volkswagen. Occasionally, I had a girlfriend. And basically, on the outside, it looked like my life was okay. But during the 20s, inside, there was something happening constantly inside where I just couldn't really accept what's going on in my life. And I didn't know what to do. So I had a kind of inner crisis for several years. And what actually happened when I look back on it now, when I look back, I see that in a way, I got some kind of help. I got, it was like existence picked me up. And in a funny way, this existence took me off to Japan. I was in those days working as an architect and I got a job in an architect's office in Tokyo and um, I was only planning to stay for my holidays three months three or four months and I ended up three and a half years in Japan I simply couldn't leave because somehow living in such an I could say alien culture because the, the culture in Japan is very, very different from the culture here in Europe. And um, I was fascinated. I was completely fascinated by Japan. But, but also by being in Japan, in Tokyo, living in Tokyo, I was living alone. And um, in, in the mirror, in the mirror of Japanese culture, I could see my English culture. For example, as you know well, in Japan, they use little sticks to eat. And of course, in England, I used a knife and fork. As a very simple example of conditioning, when I went to Tokyo, I had many judgments in the beginning that, of course, knife and fork is sophisticated and little, little chopsticks are rather primitive. I had that kind of judgment. But it wasn't long before I was able to see the advantages of the chopsticks. Very often they would be thrown away at the end of the food. So there was no question of washing them up. And also hygienic wise, much nicer to put little wooden sticks in your mouth than uh, metal 
knife and fork. Yeah. So, so there were many such situations. That's a very simple example of how I saw my conditioning. But this continued on for the whole of my three and a half years in Japan. Very intensely, I was forced to see my conditioning. At the, in those days, I, I didn't know what conditioning was. I, I had no, no idea about it. And um, in a way, it was quite shocking in a way. And in the beginning, it was more, more comparing my English culture with the Japanese culture. And uh, I remember in those days, I, I had been wearing a beard, you know, the beard I have now. I had it for several years when I was in my 20s. And the, the pressure of the Japanese society was so strong, I shaved off my beard. I wanted to be kind of clean, like the Japanese are so clean. You know? And you, you may enjoy the thought that I used to go to the local bathhouse when I needed uh, to wash myself. And the local bathhouse was divided on one side of a central wall, kindly put there by the Christians. So on the one side of the hot tub were the men, and on the other side were the women. Uh, before the Christians arrived, that was all one big, big pot. So families would go and, uh, you know, go to the... Uh, bathhouse together. It must have been a, a wonderful kind of cult, cultural meeting place. But anyway, as a Westerner with a beard, sitting in the, uh, the local, um, was kind of a, a kind of strong situation, really. And I think the whole pressure of having a beard, uh, did, in the end, I just had to shave it. It was like, a, like I was trying to become like Japanese or something. It sounds completely stupid, but uh, I remember when I had left Japan, um, by then I had found a Japanese wife and we were traveling from um, Tokyo through Asia and we were heading for the Osho ashram in India together. And when we got to Bangkok, we were doing a kind of tourist thing in Bangkok. And one day there was a big group of Japanese tourists and I completely identified and I, I moved towards this group as if I was a Japanese. It was a very strange moment that on some level I, I cleaned up a bit of my English stuff. And so now I, I, there was a space to become Japanese. But of course, I wasn't Japanese, so it didn't work very well. <clears throat> So when we when we start to get in touch with the fact that our conditioning creates a kind of robotic lifestyle, then I think inside yourself, and I would say for all the people I can see on the screen tonight, inside yourself, something happened where you couldn't just accept that. And so you started to, to inquire, you started maybe to meditate, you started to look look in a new way at what's called the human life and in the beginning this like it was for me in tokyo in the beginning this is not comfortable at all it's even uncomfortable so i'm english and i'm here in this book i'm i'm remembering a, a moment when i was going to work in london in the crowded tube train and uh, I was kind of squashed into a corner and a big man came in and stood next to me and I stood on his feet quite hard. And what happened? He said sorry to me. So whether you know the English condition, I don't know, but this word sorry is a very strong English conditioning because in England, everybody is very insecure about whether they're good enough. As you know, in England, they have this very strong king and queen story going on, and everybody understands the king or the queen. We just recently changed from a queen to a king. He, he, he or she is always going to be number one. So there's no question about that. 
And then around them, there's another group. You can say number two, and it goes filters on down through the English society. So everybody's very busy trying to decide if they're higher or lower. And you meet people and you start getting to know them. There's this subtle game goes on. You know, am I higher? Am I lower? Maybe I put a special clothes that makes me a bit higher. And so this game is going on in England, which leaves people very insecure about whether they're good enough. And so they've always got sorry, always sorry is on, the, on, the, on their tongue, you see. And of course, I had this. I also had this. I don't have it anymore, luckily. I don't think I feel at all sorry about myself. Now I'm, I, I can say since many years, I accept myself as I am. I'm not particularly perfect. I'm not particularly imperfect. I'm just who I'm supposed to be in any moment. This is, of course, very relaxing because then you start to be much more authentic. And when you start to be more authentic, you start to feel yourself inside in a deeper place, because it's no longer just your mind, your conditioned mind, but gradually you have been opening up into your being and you start to function from your being. And this feels very different from functioning from the conditioned mind. So in this first uh, chapter, look at, looking at the conditioning of our mind, uh, this is a very important beginning very important beginning. And then Christian Mercy is asking, can the mind so heavily burdened completely resolve its conditioning? So can you really do something about it? And of course the answer is yes, you can. The first step is to see it, to be aware of it. But the one thing that will get you out of this conditioning, and only this one thing, is to find out about your I. Let's see. So everybody, <clears throat> everybody on the screen tonight has been working with me for some time. And as you know, I'm uh, very much uh, conditioned. I'm being conditioned by Ramana Maharshi, you can say. Conditioned by Ramana Maharshi. Uh, but this is a conscious conditioning. And, of course, he's famous for this question, who am I? You see. So the, the really big step out of our conditioning is when we resolve the I. While we're still attached to the I, we're likely to be still attached to our conditioning because the conditioning is of the I. So in order to release ourselves from our conditioning, we need to uh, examine the uh, attachment we have to the I. And uh, there's a quotation here in this first chapter from uh, Ramana Maharshi about this I. And he says, you have to ask yourself the question, who, who am I? This investigation will lead in the end to the discovery of something within you which is behind the mind, behind the mind. Solve that great problem and you will solve all the other problems. See, so when I, I remember when I first read that, I thought, wow, that sounds very good. I just resolved the I and then all my other problems will collapse. See. And this is what happens because everything is attached to the I. It's the I that's conditioned. So if you can resolve what is this I, then you, you can't really believe it because then all this other stuff, which has been making you robotic, starts to drop away. And when it happened to me, uh, it happened to me in the presence of Papaji, uh, now about 30 years ago, I think, 30, 30, a bit more than 30 years ago. When this happened, it released an enormously powerful energy phenomena. And out of this energy phenomena, which I can remember went on for at least a month, 
out of the, this phenomena, I started to notice that some of John David's um, conditioning had actually just disappeared very, very easily without me doing anything. It just disappeared completely. And then I discovered that there were ma mainly two, two um, conditionings that were still powerfully left inside me. One was, I'm not good enough. And the other was, I'm not going to survive. And the I'm not going to survive was always feeling a bit funny because I understood that I'd already not survived. So this process of, of um, resolving the I is what you could call ego death. So this moment feels somehow like a death because if we are very identified with I, then this I dissolves, you're left with a feeling of death actually, because this I is your identification with who you are. And suddenly when this is resolving itself, you're left for some time with a curious inner feeling of not being here anymore. So this takes some time to resolve, but gradually everything starts to get more and more grounded and you find yourself living more and more out of of your being and it goes by itself it goes by itself it it, it took some time it took some longer time it, i remember <clears throat> that i'd move i moved from uh, from india to australia i hadn't been to australia before but i went to australia i wanted a kind of new new experience of life and after i'd been in australia some time i woke up one morning and I realized that this I'm not good enough had disappeared. I didn't really notice when it disappeared. It seemed like a month or so before it must have disappeared. And I'd been living without this thought, but I didn't notice that I was living without this thought. But suddenly one morning I realized somehow that, well, it seems to have resolved itself. So I'd been working on that in between leaving India and arriving in Australia, that was kind of the issue that I was still looking at and trying to understand that this, I'm not good enough. And of course, I'm not good enough was a very um, strong cultural conditioning being English. And um, finally it resolved itself. And so now since many years, I, have i think still some subtle englishness about me probably you can judge it better but having now lived in germany for 20 years i feel like i've become maybe the first non-speaking german german so i've taken on kind of the german culture in some way but it's always a bit funny because i can't speak any german and actually to be honest don't really want to um but still inside, I've, I, I, I see that I've become aligned with certain aspects of German. Because English people, for example, they never show up on time. And uh, here in Germany, people always show up on time. And so after 20 years of being taken by German people to meetings on time, I'm now able to go to meetings myself on time, you see? So this just changed by itself. Not a particularly important thing, maybe, but it's a little indication to me that, um, yeah, I'm more, I've become more German than English after all these years. And anyway, from my opinion, there isn't such a big difference between the German culture and the English culture. I mean, Germans are definitely a bit more perfect than English are, but anyway. So... So anyway, this whole subject comes down to this inquiry of who am I? And, and everybody on the screen tonight knows that that's the main thrust of what we're doing here in Open Sky House. And it takes time. It takes um, a strong effort to really see your conditioning. 
and it takes a big effort to um to really accept the fact that it would be nice to change certain things and i just want to bring your attention that here in this book we have um very nice color pages so here is the one for j christian mercy Ah, oh, here here so we have a page for j christian mercy and each of the masters who whose quotation there are 30 masters in this book and um so in this book i'm suggesting uh, on on each master has a page and on that page you can find his website i'm suggesting a book which in my opinion might be the best book from j christian murti and a little bit about his life very sweet man very sweet man So then uh, I want to switch in this first chapter to um, to another quotation about conditioning, because I find when I meet people, many people have an authority issue. So and if you're English, you have this, I'm sorry, but in the world as a whole, uh, there's a very strong tendency of having an authority issue which almost certainly comes out of growing up in a family with a, a father and very often in families father gets the last word in difficult situations and so he he is a kind of manifestation of god you can say in the family i remember once sitting in a restaurant in uh in Lucknow when I was with Papaji and this family came in the husband and wife and two children they sat together they seemed rather a nice friendly kind of family and then the menu came and then the father looked at the menu and he ordered lunch for everybody he never asked anybody what they would like to eat but he just ordered lunch you see and this is not untypical I would say of the operation of of fathers in many families they they take on the authority i wouldn't dare to do that with my kids so i ask them what do you want to eat you know and then they have they nearly always know exactly what they want to eat and probably they have more strong ideas about what they don't want to eat and also what they want to drink so i i feel i have to uh, naturally want to to uh, respect you know the kids what they what they would like but in this family i was watching in the restaurant i mean they seemed very nice people together but the father gave the the, the family no choice he just ordered ordered the food you see and uh during when i during the time i was interviewing indian masters for this project of mine blueprints for awakening I met um, Swami Dayananda, and this was a very beautiful meeting because he was one of the most powerful teachers in India. He was, in some ways, you could say he was the Indian Pope. He would be invited to the United Nations, and he was constantly traveling in the world teaching. So when I met him, he was getting on a little bit, so he wasn't traveling so much. He was more available. So every year for some years, we would go and visit his ashram. And we had, I had a lot of chances to talk to him. And um, I asked him about this authority issue. So this is his answer. People who are afraid of gurus have an authority problem, a problem centered on father, and they have to solve it it is a psychological problem and it's it means that they're afraid of authority the guru is not authority the guru is one who makes you see that you are not different not any different from him he doesn't say i am the guru you are nobody he says 
you are the whole. Not only does he say that, but he also makes you see that. He makes an honest attempt to make you see what is the authority in this. So he he was, uh, you know, a, 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 a great spiritual teacher, but he was basically suggesting that if you have an authority issue, which uh, I think I definitely had in for most of my life, and I think everybody tends to have this this issue, especially if you're younger, you tend to have this issue. And he's saying this is not really a spiritual issue. This is a psychological issue. And you can get help from a psychologist about this issue. See. The guru, the, the word guru actually means the one who brings light. So this is a nice, actually a very nice word because it suggests somebody on the outside who brings light into what might be your darkness, your misknowledge mis mis or misunderstandings. So this is nothing to be, nothing to have an authority issue about. And uh, it was very funny for me because for many years I was with Osho and after he departed, I found myself going to visit Punjaji and his nickname was Papaji. And I had this situation when I first came to him that I still had my authority issue. And I was always laughing inside that this new teacher was called Papa, Papa, you see. And I guess this nickname came out of the fact that most of the people who were drawn to sit with him had this issue somehow. And he was a very kind of fatherly um, teacher. He was a very big man, uh, rather, um, how can I say, rather humble and simple in his own um, manifestation. But of course, we projected to him the father, the papa, papaji. Anyway, so um, I think this is, this fear of authority is quite important because uh, in Europe, we tend to have in the back of our history, whether you're Italian, whether you're German, whether you're Russian, whether you're English, we, we have in our kind of psyche, as we're growing up, this kind of strong authority. So um, this has really a big effect because if I think about my upbringing in England, it's a sort of subtle way or even not so subtle way that you give away your own power. You know, if you feel somebody is an authority and you give them permission to be your authority, for example, I, I think uh, in the next days in, uh, in Russia, they're gonna have an election, you see. And Russia is a country, if you go back in the history of Russia, where, Almost, you can say, they've always had a dominant uh, authority. So they've had, they've had uh, kings in the past. They've had um, Soviet leaders, di dictatorial leaders like um, Stalin in the near future. And now, since about 20 years, they have a, a president who assumes uh, the role of a dictator. And the Russian people have been conditioned over centuries to, to basically accept this situation. And the effect, of course, is that they disempower themselves. So in this election in the next few days, um, there'll be an enormous uh, majority in favor of uh, Putin, uh, because the Russian people are so deeply conditioned to act uh, without their own power, you can say. They, they kind of like it. They're, they're kind of comfortable with that. Uh, so in the book here, there's a, a funny example to do with Putin. So um, 
it was a few years ago in the south of Russia, they had a, a Grand Prix race and Putin came as a spectator to this race. And, you know, when they finish the race, the, the first three drivers, they get to go to a special kind of room where they can relax, drink some water and prepare themselves to go out to get the, the award for winning the race. So these three drivers were in this small room and there was a TV camera in there and Putin came in to this room. And he of course came in with the inner idea or the inner authority that I'm the president, you know, I'm the, I'm the most important guy, I'm the president. So he walks in, so I, I wondered what, I was watching this on television and I, and so President Putin is standing there looking as if he's expecting something. I wondered what was going to happen. And the English guy who won the race very casually shook Putin's hand. Putin tried to hug him and he wasn't really interested in the hug. You could feel that he was completely busy with his own situation. And here was this great authority, the president of Russia, being treated very casually. I was very impressed by that. Okay, and I have one more, one more chapter I would like to introduce. And then I would invite you to dialogue with me about the issues from this chapter. So there's another chapter which is titled That Which Never Changes. And this is a very interesting, uh, very interesting moment because along the way I met a, a, a German student of Papaji. He was called Hans. And uh, he was one of the earliest of the Papaji students. And in those days, Papaji was living in Europe and he'd met Papaji uh, in Europe. And he would come every year to India. And in those days, Papaji wasn't well known at all. And so he would go and stay with Papaji in a guest house. They would even share a room together. And they would, in the daytime, they would go for walks in the countryside together. So he, he had very deep, very deep relationship with Papaji over several years. And when I met him, I, I, I was very touched from this man because he was a very humble and simple man with a lot of clarity. And he told me um, about a moment he had with Papaji. So in this moment, Han said to Papaji, you can stay in peace and stillness. I cannot. Why does it come and go with me? With you, I see this strength, love, and being perfectly at ease. My experiences pass. So you can imagine them walking along the river together and then Hans asked Papaji because they had a very familiar, very close um, connection. And so Hans could ask this question to Papaji. Papaji answered, why do you say this moment comes and goes and not your other experience? Then Hans says, I call my states of peace experiences because they are short compared with the length of my usual life. But Papaji said, I don't call that experience. I call experience what comes and goes. Papaji wanted me to see this is your nature. It doesn't come and go. The other things that are adopted by culture, environment, and whatever, he means other conditionings like religion, are what come and go. 
you see. And when he told me this story, I must say, I was rather shocked, actually, because I never saw it before in my life so clearly as Papaji had made it. Because most of us are doing exactly the same thing. When we have a moment of peace, when we have maybe a moment where strong energy is happening, we, we call it inside, we say, oh, I'm having a spiritual experience. I'm having a spiritual experience. And we have been conditioned as we grow up. We've been conditioned that everything that happens in our life is our life. That's kind of the solid part. And then on this solid part, we have these experiences. And as Hans says, very often the experiences, spiritual experiences, are much uh, shorter. They just happen sometimes. And therefore, it's very easy to make those um, moments of experience, we make them special. But we don't realize that our whole life is special. So, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. That's a, a wrong spoken there. I spoke wrong there. So, so we gradually realize that these moments, these short moments, are bringing us to our being. And we realize gradually that the being is our essential nature. And we can also realize that all the stuff goes on in our life, meeting people, making adventures, traveling, uh, whatever we do in our life. Yeah that this is constantly changing, constantly changing. But who we are, who is, who is here, doesn't change. Doesn't change. And when we come to realize that our fundamental nature doesn't change, then, then everything inside us can get Re, um, well, can be transformed. It's a transformation. It's a complete transformation that you suddenly realize that who you are essentially is a constant. It's a constant. And the amazing thing about this constant is that it's the same constant as everybody else. The whole of humanity has the same constant. And of course, then in our daily lives, everybody on this screen tonight, everybody has a different experience every day. All, all kind of things happen, constantly changing things. You know, you can be sad for some time. And then, I don't know, you're walking in the street and you, you see something in the street that touches you and you laugh and the sadness gradually disappears and some new emotion will come. It's constantly, constantly changing through the day. Whatever, however it starts in the morning is going to go through many changes. Yeah. So, so this is what Papaji was showing Hans in that moment. And what Hans was expressing is what everybody on the screen could express. And when we realize the truth of what Papaji said in that moment, I think that's a very beautiful moment, really, because it allows you to really uh, be open to transform your life and to, 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 to see more clearly about what's really happening in our life. And this is not so easy because we're deeply conditioned in the other way, in the, in the way that Hans was talking. I'd like to read a little bit from, from my talk that I gave at the time we did this book. If you want to experience your true nature, if you want to know who you really are, if you want to get the full human experience in your lifetime, then what's being discussed here between Hans and Papaji is very important, very, very important. 
many of you are spiritual seekers and occasionally you have this glimpse and in this glimpse you feel very good you tell your friend i had a spiritual experience hans is also telling papaji that he sometimes has an experience and papaji says no no not like that he says that your conditioned daily life with all your ideas, concepts, judgments, all these kinds of things stored in your conditioned mind mean that you are constantly having different kinds of experiences. In fact, very often we keep repeating the same experiences. We call it my life. And it's almost robotic. It's very difficult to see it's robotic, to get an insight, unless you're used to really looking inside. Or you have a friend who has some understanding and can act as a mirror for you. So I made an interview with Hans, actually. I'd like to read something that he told me in the interview. In Papaji's presence, I found it easier and easier to be at peace. And he said that after four or five years, he felt pretty good. I asked him, when you say you are feeling so good, do you mean that the mind was quiet? and you were feeling clear and peaceful? And his answer was, not totally, but always relatively. And then I asked, when you were in Germany, would you still maintain this? He replied, no. I couldn't do it continuously with Papaji, nor when I was alone, not in Germany or India. I couldn't because I had the wrong idea of having to maintain it, as if it were something one has to hold on to with effort. Rather, it comes in the moment when effort subsides. So this misunderstanding is what Papaji mainly helped me with. So this is also a very, also a very important point, that if we in fact, have a glimpse, and we are very touched from this glimpse, then we want to kind of hold it. And we, we have the idea that I, I have to do something to hold this. I have to do something to hold this. But what you're trying to hold is your true nature, is your being, is who you are, your essential nature. So you don't need to hold it. That's you. You see. So this is also a very important aspect to what we're talking about and what I'm talking about, because it's very easy to just allow this very deep conditioning to just constantly take us, take us in the in the wrong understanding. You see. And in, in order not to fall into this wrong understanding, we need a lot of awareness, a lot of self-awareness. And we need the courage to constantly look at things inside us which are very familiar. And it's not so easy. It's not so easy to look and challenge things which are um, very familiar, that have been deeply conditioned. I remember when I, when I first came to Osho, he gave me a new name after some time. And I, I was a bit, um, how can I say? I didn't really think that having a new name would make much difference. But it did. And in the, in the early months after he gave me this name, it was a great um, device because we get very familiar with our name. It's like, when everybody calls us a certain name, 
it's like everything to do with that character is 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 our daily experience you can say and and it's a kind of solid um base for looking at ourselves and then you change this name right and people start calling you another name and then suddenly it's as if you can't just carry on with the old conditionings because suddenly the old conditionings are not fitting onto this new name. I can't maybe explain it so well, but um, some of you, well, many of you on the screen tonight have had a new name from me. And so you maybe know this, what I'm talking about. But anyway, for, for some months, there's something going on where it makes it much easier to see your conditioning by just by having a different name. And so we play this game in the, in the Open Sky House community. And some people who've been living in the house for a long time, they've had several different names. And if I feel getting too stuck with one name, I'm uh, interested always to change it to some other name. Yeah. We used to do the same thing with the, where people sleep in the house. Every maybe three or four months, I would make a new list and everybody would shift around, you know. So wherever you were sleeping before, suddenly you're sleeping some other place. But this wasn't very popular. And uh, somehow gradually over the years, the people who stayed in the house longer, they got their, my room, my room, you know. And so now we don't really move around anymore very much, you see, because that's, that's what humans like. We like to have our place with our carpet, you know, with our bed, with whatever. Yeah, we, we, we feel very comfortable with all these familiar things around, you see. But uh, these, these familiar things around are, are a strange kind of, um, how can I say, um, a strange kind of imprisonment, if you see it. I mean, I mean, personally, I have to admit that I have a very strong kind of collector's mode in my character. So I'm surrounded, for example, in my apartment, I have a, a special chair, like a reading chair with a light. And uh, it, it started with a one bookshelf of kind of spiritual books. So my idea in the beginning was, you know, I sit in this special chair with the light, and I read these books. And then I bought more books because I like buying art books as well. So gradually, if you come in my room now, you can see the chair has now got a, a kind of wall all around it of books, piled up of books, you see. So now I, it's become a kind of imprisonment of books or something, or a prison of books. You see, because I'm a, I have this kind of collector mentality. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, okay, so that's um, yeah. Okay, so the subject tonight is conditionings, and my plan is that over the next two months, I'll go through all the chapters in this book. So tonight is a typical. Uh, going to be a typical meeting over the next two months where I will take each each week a different chapter. So out of tonight's talk, I'm also encouraging you to, to get out your copy of the book and read at least these three chapters that I've, I've been uh, mentioning. But you could read the whole of chapter one, for example, now, because it's all on the subject of conditioning in different different ways. Okay, so would somebody like to dialogue with me about this subject of conditioning? You can just wave your hand. Okay, Pavati. Hello? Yeah, I would like to talk about this. Um, 
I find it difficult to see what is my character and what is the condition. Well, your character, your character is influenced from your conditioning. Mm -hmm. Like this thing I was telling about the books. So I have for whatever it means, for example, I can remember when I was a kid, I was living in the edge of the countryside and with my friends, we often went out on our bicycles and we collected birds eggs. I mean, now I'm sure I wouldn't do that, but in those days, so many years ago, um, there seemed to be plenty of birds and plenty of eggs, and we didn't have any problem to go and pinch some eggs. Yeah? And we climbed up the trees and took the eggs. So I had a collection of eggs. So I don't know if, if, my, um, if that part of my personality started in those days or whether it was probably something more basic inside me. But I can look at my life and see that I've always been a kind of collector. So this, is, <laughs> this is one aspect. And, you know, it, it is definitely a conditioning, but in a way you could say it's, it's not a conditioning that really uh, interferes. It doesn't prevent me being uh, who I am. Yeah. So, so these we can say this is John Davis' personality. He likes collecting things. You like cooking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but, like, but I just see also with the girls that they are, have some things where I don't know if they are conditioned. Or like, oh, don't talk about the girls. If you look at yourself, you're you're very much in cooking. You're very much in the kitchen. This is a place where you feel safe. You feel secure. Uh, you feel enjoyment. Uh, you feel your creativity. Many different aspects of your personality is manifesting in the kitchen. But why are you in the kitchen? Because you might be in the garden. All those aspects of security and creativity and so on, you could also express by being somebody who loves gardening. But I don't know if you love gardening, but it's not as strong as loving the kitchen, for example. You know? So there's some reason also. There's some conditioning behind mm -hmm. you um, liking the kitchen, probably. Something that happened maybe when you were little. I, I, I don't know. Maybe you know it. Do you know? Do you understand why the kitchen is so attractive to you? I, I could see that this uh, was easier for me than to uh, to lead the Open Sky uh, seminar. Because it's not so easy for me to do computer work or to write letters. Yeah, but there, there's a reason, you know. I mean, you could have, you could have been, you. I mean, for example, if we consider Rada, Rada's probably very good at writing letters, and I don't know if she's good. At, she's quite good also in the kitchen, but it's not her. Uh, it's not as dominant as it is for you to be in the kitchen. She's more in the office writing things, organizing things. Yeah. So she has some conditioning about that and you have some conditioning about the kitchen. Yeah. But it's not, it's not really the conditioning that we're talking about tonight because tonight we're focusing more on the conditioning in our mind which creates us into being very robotic, you know. I don't find you being robotic in the kitchen. Are you robotic in the kitchen? No, that's right. What I could see is um, last year when I gave up my room, you know, I need... it was the first time in all the years here I did it. Right, right. But I see how much more free I felt after this. You felt more free. Yeah, it was were... really amazing. That it yeah. felt really free. Mm -hmm. right. And this I often can see when I do also things where I'm afraid of. 
that if they did this, right? Yes, and what I remember years ago now, um, you were afraid more free to drive, after my drive to Cologne. Do you remember that? You had a fear to drive to Cologne. Do you remember years ago now? Oh, and yes. <laughs> Remember this? And and then you did it one day. You did it. And then I think now probably you have no problem to drive to Cologne. Yeah. And so if we become aware of things in our life, uh, like, you know, being afraid to drive to Cologne, if we deal with it, then we release it. So what we want to do with all our conditionings is we want to look at them, we want to become aware about them, and we want to let these go. And, um, you know, this is a constant kind of work that goes on. You know, in, in, in the mirror of our surroundings, we are able to see how we are functioning. And if we're honest, we can see when we're being robotic, when we're being actually functioning from, from our conditioning. And as we as we come more and more inside to investigate, then we come to this um, quotation from Ramana Maharshi that we have to find out what is before the mind, what is before the mind. And if we find out what is before the mind, mm -hmm. then we also discover that our conditionings tend to collapse because our conditionings are for me so if me disappears they also disappear the conditionings disappear or most of them disappear because all these conditionings are identified with this i so if, if there's no i where do these conditionings where can they land they can't land anywhere Mm -hmm. but the character stays yeah uh, there, mm -hmm. there is there is also a character there is our beingness uh, and there is also a character and you can see this in here in our mm -hmm. community it's made up of many different uh, characters you can look at my daughters and see even these two daughters who are living uh, almost like twins they're not identical twins but they're twins they're born at the same moment out of the same mother and uh, yet they have very different characters and as they're getting older these characters are um, developing you can say that different characters are developing and there is also something similar both things so we have a character or personality but we also have something fundamental and when we live from this fundamental place then our life uh, becomes i would say a lot more um nourished is that okay 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 Okay, so let's see if somebody else would like to comment. Okay, Krishna. Are you there, Krishna? Yes, I'm there. Uh, yeah, I can... Uh get myself very often in this uh, authority boss whoever is in charge is uh, boss and i try to do something I, I i it's like a radio you put me out and then the other one is taking over and i'm just functioning but i'm not really myself anymore i feel that very strong and it also gives me very bad times and very bad feelings and i want to go out somehow i i choose to go to the toilet or drink a coffee or something just to move out of the situation and come back to myself in a way but um, it changed a lot and 
I've I felt it changed a lot in 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 combination with love because here I feel a lot of love from the people. I really feel that in a way. So I can see that, that it is like this, but I also have always the possibility to just be silent and and realize that I'm there, that I'm that I'm in a being that I don't have to make to go into this mind fuck or into whatever happens. They just can stay silent and enjoy myself a bit in this situation and then come out and 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 have a lot of energy and go into the situation again. So it changed a lot. And I, mean, I think I think you've done some kind of investigation about this authority issue, yeah. yeah. I mean, as I heard, uh, you 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 had a kind of strong situation when you were a child, yeah. That is it right that your father or father and mother together, they were pretty dominant parents, and they were not really. They were like the parent I was talking about. They were they were not saying well what you want to do they were telling you this is what you should do is that right absolutely right so i mean this is this is the rather a common style of parenting but maybe that common style was common 50 years ago and it's less common today i don't know i can't really judge that but um many of the people that that have come to the uh community they they have strong issues with this authority because when we grow up in a typical family it's quite likely we have a father who orders our lunch and doesn't ask us what we would like to eat yeah because maybe it's changed recently but in the in the past this is just an, an accepted behavior within a family that the father decides the father's paying and he decides and he has ideas about how he'd like his children to to what he'd like his children to uh, i think your father didn't he he want you to play um some music instrument i've forgotten which one did you have to play an instrument that you didn't want to play yes a lot and i had huh? to learn an instrument it was part of the thing he wanted me to be or he yeah, to... so he had his ideas about his darling son, you know, and part of that was his darling son should, let's say, play the piano, yeah. And maybe you didn't like the piano, you would have rather played the violin, yeah. Maybe if he would have asked you, what would you like to play, you might have said, well, actually, I don't want to play anything. I'd rather spend my time in the garden, yeah. But he didn't ask you that. He told you, you have to play an instrument. But then he could have said, well, what instrument would you like to play? But he didn't even ask that. He told you, okay, I want you to play, let's say, the piano. And then you didn't really want to play the piano, but you couldn't resist because you had the kind of father that um, couldn't really be resisted. Maybe you tried sometimes to resist him, and then he maybe was disciplining you because that's part of that kind of style yeah if you want to i mean if you want to assert your authority and you think of mussolini or stalin or or hitler uh or kings and queens they had to assert their authority by by um strong means you can say strong means they would have an army around them and this army would crush any opposition to their authority now in in russia for example putin has dismembered all the newspaper and television companies who might in any way be against him so over the years quietly quietly over the years he's taken away any opposition just recently the man who was his most effective opposition over the last maybe 10 years was put in jail for completely ridiculous reasons. And recently he died in jail, almost certainly murdered by an order from Putin. You see, we probably never know exactly what happened, but it's almost clear that basically this man was murdered by Putin, you see. So 
so this is the way that the authority maintains his authority and and if the people are around are accepting that situation and we're going to see it i think it's maybe sunday this next sunday in a few days time i think is the election and um we're going to see how 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 this um how the opposition uh, no i don't mean the opposition how how this situation in russia has developed that putin has become an absolute authority if there's somebody he doesn't like uh, they 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 get an accident you know there are many accidents happening in russia with people who were um in some ways became against putin you know if they have journalists who've written something against him or maybe some close um per person to him who then becomes negative i mean the next thing that happens is they fall out of the window and you know i don't know it's um you know authority is always like that and and the effect on the rest of us is that we lose our power so what you're saying about your own things you know in your daily life if you watch you'll see that by having this authority you you disempower yourself and you have this in your character that you 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 don't really um i mean being empowered doesn't mean you're screaming and shouting and saying it's got to be my way that's not really how it works but you have a lot of for example you have a lot of technical ability with electrics and plumbing and all kind of things and you you can easily um how can i say you can easily put that together in a certain situation but maybe you don't always do that because you're waiting to be told what to do and then when you're told what to do and it doesn't meet your own uh, idea then you feel frustration so you you just have to see what is your part of that you see you have to see what's your part of that and and as you keep on investigating you're going to come to this fundamental question about the eye and ramana is reminding us that we have to discover about this eye the nature of the eye and he gives us this wonderful encouragement because he says that if you find out about this eye all your other things are going to collapse you see so this is a big encouragement because you get a big value out of resolving the eye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Anybody else? Maybe one more person. Uh, okay. Anybody else like to? Uh... Okay, I think I take uh, Lakshmi. We talk often, so I take Monica. Okay, Monica. Yes. Yeah, I realized that uh, this dialogue between Papaji and Hans resonates a lot with me. That uh, this identification, you know, and and how how uh, how we are used to call to call it experience, how much we somehow lost the the being in touch or not being in touch, but living from our beingness, I, I could also call it. And right. somehow what came into my mind was um, many years ago, as you are in arts also a lot, many years ago, it was very popular, these pictures, these 3D pictures, you know? Right. Um, where I found you have to look with these pictures, you have to look behind. And then another dimension opened. 
and you saw something completely different. Somehow mm. this at these uh, in these years fascinated me very much because I felt um, somehow with awakening, it, it must be in a way similar because it, it has a lot to do with a shift in our focus. Right, right. And this happens by itself, actually, you know, that you, I mean, to get a taste of, of that, it, I was suggesting that if we change our name or we change our uh, familiar surroundings, you know, we, I've had several experiences over the last 20 years where somebody wanted to come to the community, but they couldn't leave their yellow carpet or they couldn't leave their bed, you know. So they were giving away most of their staff, but then they came to some particular thing. Like I remember one woman had a yellow, a beautiful yellow carpet and another with a very special bed. And, and they, it was like impossible to let those go because the identification got so strong yeah, that you, you don't know anymore what is yourself and what is the carpet because the carpet becomes uh, so identified with or something like that. And so we, we were talking a little bit about, you know, we in the community, we used to change the rooms, you see. So maybe you had one experience for some months in a room that you felt was, ah, oh, this is really a nice room. When I look out of the window, there's a tree or something like this. And then you get put in another room and there's no tree, you know, and it's, you, you, you start to... Uh, be resistant maybe to moving to this other room but then after you've been there for some time then you become identified with something else I don't know you know it has a yellow carpet or something who knows and and we we need to see how easily we get identified with the bits and pieces of our life so in my case I after this meeting I probably will go and sit in my reading chair and I will be able to to laugh about the wall of books around this chair now you know i kind of built a a fortress of books around my chair and i can reach out you know to many different books and i mean it's, it's kind of funny you know and probably if i could have the guts one day to pack up all those books and i don't know put them away you know give them away or put them away or something then th th there's a new kind of um, emptiness in 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 uh, inside us it, it affects us in some way mm. yet you know i somehow i think you you may have these addictions in a way be, and having an awareness about attach it is an attachment and yet in a way, feel free about it or with it, somehow knowing that if it's appropriate, um, it it will show up and 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 you would recognize and 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 follow what where the energy leads you in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think self-awareness is a very important aspect to what we're talking about today. Mm. We need to develop the ability to, in a very honest way, see how we function. Yeah. And it's yeah. not very easy. It's not very easy because a lot of things are so automatic, we, we, it's almost impossible to see it, actually. Yeah, yeah. Because also, you know, when I when I see an an addiction or an attachment, let's say attachment, there was a time in my life when I um, consciously went against it, you know, and uh, somehow something softened much more. That I can dance with with it or be with it or have a, a piece of chocolate and be with it and really enjoy and really feel, do I really want another one or not? You know, this presence while I'm 
following something, you know, and right. not um, thinking I have to uh, fight it or I have to um, uh, really resist it or so, you know. Somehow my ideas uh, on my long journey the way I, I I am with things or deal with things uh, somehow changed and it's it's much softer. Right. And maybe it becomes more spontaneous also because somehow inside what we're talking about, there's some element about spontaneous. I can't really be yes. spontaneous because I've got all these books around me. <laughs> And I, I have the feeling, you know, the one on the right, I should read that one. And the one on the left, I should read that one. And the ones in front of me, there's several things I should read. So I'm kind of creating a kind of muddy field of books around me. And if I can just somehow throw, throw them all away, uh, which I'm actually not going to do, but if I would throw all this away, there's a sort of space, a new space to be spontaneous. And then maybe somebody comes and says, well, you should read this book. Why don't you look at this book? It's quite an interesting book. Mm. And um, and then I, you know, take a new book, which I didn't have in my uh, collection before. Yeah. So do some sort of spontaneity, I think, if we're not careful. Yeah. And what I realize, sometimes I have an idea in my mind about something I want to do. And then I do something totally different because I, I, I more often feel an, a flow that is somehow underneath, you know, and I feel more connected with this flow, I would say, and not so much, even though my, my mind has a plan or I, an idea, more often within the last weeks, I happen, it, it happens something else you know and and right. to more trust this flow that I, I i feel more and more right right mm. good good okay so nice talking with you and uh, i think we'll stop now so i just remind everybody that if you're really spontaneous and you'll like to then this weekend in spain in our house in denia we have a Vipassana weekend. And uh, I think there's no Spanish people on the screen tonight, but nevertheless, um, you can buy a ticket and rush down there. It's uh, going to be a nice weekend, I think. And then at the end of the month uh, is Easter time. And uh, here in Hitov, we'll be meeting together from Thursday night until Monday evening. So four-day retreat over Easter here in the Open Sky House in Hitor. So everybody's welcome and uh, be spontaneous. Okay. Good. So, I mean, I was very touched today by this uh, space launch, you know, this, uh, I think they call it Starship. So um, this is the largest rocket that humans have ever uh, sent up. Yeah? And it's capable of carrying, I think it's 200 tons, 200 tons, which is an enormous, uh, enormous load to carry. And this is because Musk has the idea that he wants to populate Mars. I think they're starting off with the moon and then they're going to they're going to create a, a colony on Mars, right? I remember when I first heard this some years ago, I immediately my mind immediately said, you know, crazy stuff, you know, blah, blah, blah. But watching this rocket today, this is the third test of this huge rocket. And today's test went went completely perfectly. With, with with their intentions and uh you can sense that it won't be very long maybe only another year when these rockets will be able to go up and come back because his idea is to reuse the rocket you know 
until recently, all the rockets that went up, they came down into the ocean. And one of the big um, contributions is that Musk realized that the rockets have to be reusable. So now he's his, most of his rockets, uh, they go up and when they come back down, uh, they can come down and sit on the on the land again. They started off on uh, on the sea. They had special platforms floating in the sea, and they started practicing coming down on these platforms. And sometimes the rocket would fall over into the sea, but now they can bring them down onto land and reuse the rockets. So some of his rockets are used, you know, many many times. So the cost of the rockets becomes much, much less. Mm. So anyway, so some of you or maybe your children may be on your way to Mars in a few years' time. Good luck. <laughs>